Thai dishes almost always combine all flavors. They're literally an orchestra, a real gastronomic orchestra. First, a delicate sweetness enters. Then, the section of sourness joins in. Sour, sweet, sour, sweet. Then, bam! And the spicy section takes the floor and some neat notes of bitterness with it. And then, the aftertaste of saltiness, a rich and delicate salty aftertaste. And let's not forget about the textures and the flavors. They're always simply unique here. And then an interlude, but a very short one, because in Thailand, it's impossible not to eat for longer periods of time. Everyone knows that Thai cuisine is famous. Many have tried Tom Yam and Thai curry, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. We came here to show you the country and the people who were able to create truly great cuisine. In this country, there truly are no dishes that taste bad. In the worst case, the food here is just delicious, but more often than not, it is breathtakingly good. Anton and I shot a serial film documentary called Food of Thailand, and in it, we will reveal the secrets of the legendary Tom Yam and Pad Thai dishes. We will deep dive into the thick of the crazy day and nighttime food Thai markets. We will introduce you to the phenomenon of food carts, which are restaurants on wheels, and you'll personally meet Rambo, the ex-world boxing champion who was saved by the monks from death and now makes noodles for the locals on a food cart. We'll talk to the great Jay Fai, one of the two Michelin star street food chefs in the world. We'll be trying horseshoe crabs who have lived on Earth for a little longer than we have, for 400 million years. We'll go north with famous American chef, book author, and restaurant owner Andy Ricker, who showed Thailand to Anthony Bourdain for CNN before us. The cuisine of northern Thailand will surprise you. Sometimes it will be scary. We'll be eating rats and crocodiles and drinking pig blood. Don't blame me, this is how the locals live. We'll be flying to the most uptown island of Thailand, Phuket, but we won't be showing it to you as a beach resort with all-inclusive hotels, but as a treasury of food that historically formed a unique cuisine, which no longer exists anywhere in the world. Oh yeah, soon you'll get a guide to Phuket's authentic food. And I've only mentioned a small part of what you're going to see. So make yourself comfortable and set the table. We don't recommend watching our series without you getting some food. This is a documentary serial movie, Food of Thailand, Episode 1, The Street Food of Bangkok. We're in Thailand. Let's be honest, one part of our people thinks that Thailand is all about beaches and all-inclusive hotels, and for the other part, it's all about nightlife and sex tourism. Anti-massage. And Thai massage, right. But as you know, we're here for other things. This is a real mecca of food, which isn't just loved and appreciated. Food is like a religion here. It's being worshipped. And today, we'll tell you all about it. This is an episode about street food, but food in Thailand is always about street food and markets. Of course, there are restaurants from the Asia's 50 best list, but they aren't the ones running the show. The spotlight belongs to the fantastic street food shops, which you don't even have to look for. They'll find you. But in all fairness, I will say that there are lots of restaurants here as well. The street food of Thailand is one of the most active and plentiful in the world. Firstly, it's open 24-7. You can always buy food on the streets. Secondly, it's endless. Sometimes it seems to me that the entire population is working in the street food industry. Thirdly, there is a culture of street food carts. Chefs build their own kitchen on wheels and cook and sell food on these carts pretty much everywhere. Moreover, there are morning, daytime, and nighttime food markets here. Forget your typical three meals a day. We're in Thailand. We'll be eating a lot and often, every hour, around the clock, and on every corner. Thai food is one of the most famous, significant, and, in my humble opinion, delicious in the world. For comparison, in the U.S., one restaurant caters to 330 people, while in Thailand, one restaurant caters to 120 people. That is, there are three times as many restaurants per capita here compared to the country with the most developed consumer culture in this world. You might say, so what if food is everywhere here? After all, the most important thing is to find delicious food. Yes, but this statement is not relevant to Thailand. Delicious food is the norm here. That is, in Thailand, you don't choose between places with food that's tasty or not. You choose between tasty, delicious, and breathtakingly delicious. We filmed a series of episodes about Thailand, and in it, we'll try to answer the question of how its cuisine happened to be like this, and also why some nations managed to create a great cuisine while others don't. 
In general, it's easier to get food on the streets than prepare it at home here. That's why street trading is so highly developed here. The street food itself is very cheap because the cost of organizing and maintaining this kind of business is tiny. By the way, in Thailand, there is a unique principle. The worse, the better. The shabbier the place looks, the better the food might be. Don't be afraid of old rusty food carts. Hurry to them and you'll be surprised. You'll remember your first exit from the airport in Bangkok for the rest of your life. You'll feel like you were in a sauna. It's very hot and humid here. Did you know that as of 2022, Bangkok is no longer Bangkok? It is now called Krung Tep Maha Nakhon. Krung Tep Maha Nakhon. All right, it's up to you, not me. Well, maybe I didn't really like the word Bangkok either. I've been in Bangkok about 15 times, and I fly here so often for a reason. The first one is the food, of course, and the second is that Bangkok is a different world, a parallel universe just a 12-hour flight from home. It's a country of surreal contrast. Here, you can find transgender call girls right across the street from ancient Buddhist temples. Five-foot large monitor lizards, which can be confused with crocodiles, swim right past your house. Green and pink taxis and tuk-tuks are driving through the streets. You can get home on a high-speed elevator if you live in the skyscraper downtown Town, or you can take a boat if you live in the old town. We think we'll take the boat. Such colorful water taxis are running across the canals of Bangkok, and we went home using one of them. We rented an apartment in the old pre-industrial part of Bangkok right on the water, and you can get there on foot, on a scooter, by car, or you can even get there by boat. These boats are called long tails and cost a little more than a taxi, but we feel like we're in Venice. What's that? Is it a house or not? 15 minutes by boat, 3 minutes on foot, and here we are. Here it is, our house. It may not be very comfortable, rather old, and located on the outskirts, but look how authentic it is here. Inside, there are many local antique things and paintings, beautiful carvings, some modest settings, two spacious bedrooms, but most importantly, a terrace. You are welcome. We rented an authentic Thai house near a canal for $85 on Airbnb. We rented it and live right next to the water. It's not just a house, it has surprises, which, by the way, could even scare someone. Firstly, there are like a thousand catfish here. Secondly, there are huge monitor lizards. Have a look. They live in an abandoned house right across the canal. So our neighbors are not people, but monitor lizards. I can only hope that they don't throw techno parties at night and that we'll be able to sleep well. And that house is located on the territory of the local temple. In general, all coastal houses belong to this temple. Here, monks in stylish orange masks water the tropical vegetation. Locals are selling food right on the premises. Here, you can come and meditate at the feet of this big golden Buddha. By the way, while walking around the area, we learn some unusual Thai know-how. Dear friends, do you have any idea why these water bottles are standing near the wheels? It's no secret that dogs love to pee on car wheels. Locals believe that dog urine is corroding rubber and that the tires deteriorate because of this. The water is there to scare away the dogs. Locals believe that the dogs see their reflection in a water bottle and don't want to urinate on themselves. This is brilliant. Being very hungry after a long journey, we went to eat at the first restaurant we came across right next to our house. And what do you think? Just a random place, a random dish from the menu, and we're blown away. Wow, wow, so tasty. It's Marry Me Andrew. Marry Me Andrew is a mark. It's the highest praise you can get in our restaurant. How come? I once invited my friends over for dinner and a restaurant chain chef, Anton Vasiliev, made some burgers. They were sick as hell. My friend Igor took a bite of it, looked at Anton and said, damn, marry me, Andrew. And Anton said, uh, I'm Anton. The burger was so good that Igor forgot that Anton's name was Anton and accidentally called him Andrew. And now, when we're having such a good meal that we're at a loss for words, it gets the marry me, Andrew mark. It's the highest degree of awesomeness. It's amazingly delicious. This is what Thailand is all about. You don't have to look for restaurants from the top 50 international list. You can just go out, go to some random cafe, and there you'll meet a culinary masterpiece, just like it happened to us right now. A random dish that I ordered is called Yum Twa Plu, and I liked it so much that I asked to go to the kitchen to see how it was cooked and what the secret is, even though it wasn't part of our plans. This is a typical Thai kitchen. You'll find such a kitchen in almost any food spot. It's difficult to call it new, clean, or cozy, and it sure wouldn't meet up to HAACP standards. But it is in such a place that the real Thai culinary masterpieces are born. And by the way, I have never gotten sick or had an upset stomach after staying more than a dozen times in Thailand. As a rule, Thai people open in cafes in the same place where they live. So the kitchen is on the first floor, the owners sleep on the second floor and put up some chairs in their yard. This is how a small Thai restaurant is born. 
So for starters, they organize a serving, lay out a lettuce leaf, and cut the boiled egg. Look, the egg here is being cut with the fishing line. Nice. The basis of this dish is winged beans. They are chopped and mixed with shallot and coconut flakes. Then they take the shrimps, chicken, and boil them. Keep in mind that they're cooked at the same time. Then the Thai sacrament begins. That very same symphony of flavors, salty fish sauce, sweet sugar syrup, sour lime juice, some spicy and slightly bitter chili pasta, and tender coconut milk. Time for a good stir. Then they mix it all with the beans, shallot, coconut flakes, and spread it over the salad. Here it is, our very first Marry Me Andrew. And also there's a canal here. So when the chef finish, if there's a leftover the food, we don't waste it. So we throw it here. Only food, we, no, we don't throw the plastic and anything on the, on the canal. We throw the food and then catfish gonna eat it. Both human can eat, fish can eat too. In our country, we have grannies feeding pigeons, and here, they feed catfish and monitor lizards. After finishing our random culinary shoot, we headed to our first target. And it doesn't take a genius to guess that our target is Tom Yam. Yes, we sure did head out, but it wasn't easy getting there, because on our way, we met a lot of very tasty obstacles. What is this? And what is this? What's the name? Nokkata. I don't know what this is. I want to try it. Our first obstacle was these strange orange balls. As I said, I have been to Thailand many times, but to this day, I always stumble across food that I've never seen and never tried. How freaking awesome, crunchy, chewy, and sweet this is. What a cool dessert. And it's made from potatoes. I thought I knew everything about potatoes. I've been eating it all my life. You make so many things from it. A potato dessert. Kai Nok Kata, a Thai dessert made of baked sweet potato, cornstarch, sugar, and salt. They mash the potatoes, add everything else to them, and make balls from the resulting dough. Then, they are fried in boiling vegetable oil. Look how beautiful they are. This is Maya Leg, Mama Leg in translation. She's been making Kai Nok Kata for more than 30 years, and jokingly calls these orange balls quail eggs. What? No way. If I didn't know that I'm eating a potato, damn, I never would have suspected it. That's a sick snack, actually. You could watch a movie and have this instead of sunflower seeds. Respect. Very cool. We persistently continue our way to Tom Yum, but we met obstacle number two. We were blocked by a sausage barricade on wheels. We're walking here and this dude here turned a scooter into a food shop on wheels and sells what seems like 20 or 30 kinds of different sausages. Thailand really is a country of sausages. They are sold right on the streets and there are tens of thousands of different kinds. I doubt that even the sausage vendors know every single one of them. I'm sure that there's a sausage institute somewhere in Thailand and someone might be writing a thesis about sausages right now. These are fish balls and sweet chili sauce. Lots of bread is used in these balls. You can barely taste the meat, but you feel a patty-like elasticity. We were almost there. However, we met obstacle number three, which we couldn't just walk past. A strange, color and shapeless substance that's being cut with scissors. I gave them a try, and surprise, it's delicious as well. What makes Thailand special? You're just walking down the street, you see something you can't explain or describe. You go there and say, I'd like to try. You don't know if this is going to be the main course, or a dessert, or just a snack. In this case, it's a dessert. It's a dessert of the poor Chinese who immigrated to Thailand, and it's called kalaji. Sticky rice dough is fried in oil and then put in a mix of sugar, sesame flour, and nuts. Well, we have arrived. Tom Yam, the most famous Thai dish abroad, a culinary masterpiece, and one of the main soups of the whole world. In the Masonic Lodge of Soups, Tom Yam would definitely be a worshipful master. I'm standing in line for soup, a common thing in Thailand. There are superstar street food joints here, where the queue never ends. Here they are preparing some amazing tom yam, and it's not that easy to get it. I will stand and wait here to buy a bowl of soup. By the way, as many of you already know, I have a Thai restaurant called Thailand Hai. I've been building it for a year. My team and I flew to Thailand five times. I was hunting for cooks. When I was running out of money for the construction, I sold my apartment, my car, and almost divorced my wife. And throughout this year, I had a small camera with me. I filmed everything, edited it into a movie, and released it. You can watch it here. It's very interesting. There's a lot about food, Thailand, business, and wild adventures. Watch it. 
Tom Yam in itself is a sour and spicy soup, which is cooked in a broth with lemongrass, galangal, and a bunch of other Thai spices. As a rule, it's cooked with seafood, local mushrooms, and the realest places add shrimp caviar, which hasn't yet fully formed, hasn't sunk into the tail, and is in the head. Well, and a lot of chili. A whole lot of chili. Actually, Tom Yam is a great dish, and I need to talk about it in detail for a long time. Therefore, a separate story about Tom Yam will soon be released on this channel, with a step-by-step -step analysis of what kind of soup it is, how to cook it, and why it is so incredible. In this restaurant, they add crunchy bamboo shoots, which make it taste even richer. Cool. This is real Thai Tom Yam. The real one. I really like spicy, but even I find it quite spicy. Tom Yam is a spicy soup. Tom translates as boil, and Yam translates as make spicy. Therefore, ordering non-spicy Tom Yam is a real crime against this dish. In Thailand High, the waiters aren't allowed to accept orders for non-spicy tam yam. It's like asking for onion soup without onion. If you're ready to try spicy food, try tam yam. If not, you can try the tam ka soup. It's a similar soup based on coconut milk, and it's not spicy. Real tam yam is a real challenge. It burns your insides, but you can't stop. That's the best medicine against a cold. It frees your nose up instantly. Spicy, right? My lips are burning. My lower lip is burning. My upper lip is burning. As if they aren't lips, but open wounds. <sighs> Anton doesn't like spicy food, but I really won't let him out of this country until he tries Tom Yam. Hmm. To be honest, in borscht, there isn't so much waste. It's more convenient for me to eat it. I thought it would be much spicier. <coughs> okay. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you have gastritis, this dish is not for you. <laughs> like you and I, Anton. Ah, uh, I'm good. We moved from one iconic Thai dish to another one, Pad Thai, fried ramen. Yes, I remember, this episode is about street food. However, we will show you how they cook Pad Thai in the most famous Pad Thai restaurant in Thailand, and therefore, the world. However, everything is fair here. Since 82 years ago, it was a tiny street point with one chef, a brave Thai woman named Semai. We are here in Thailand, the mecca of noodles. Rice ones, wheat, wheat egg, any you wish. But there is one that is a hallmark of Thailand, and it is called Pad Thai. Now we have arrived at the super famous Bangkok restaurant called Teep Samai. They're making pad thai here and seem to be doing a better job than anyone else because there are always huge queues. A few years ago, I once tried to stand in this line and couldn't. This place has existed since 1939, and those guys definitely know how to cook the right pad thai. While there's no queue yet, let's watch how the main noodles of Thailand are prepared. Again! Deep Samai, an 82 year long history, more than a thousand servings of pad thai every day, independent industrial production of noodle sauces, having their own product line in supermarkets, CNN, BBC, The Guardian, Reuters, and National Geographic wrote about their pad thai as the best noodles in the country. Deep Samai is even recommended in a book published by Louis Vuitton. Basically, if someone knows something about pad thai, it would be the owners of Tip Samai. Pad thai started from your grandmother-in-law, yes. that's her recipe? Ah, uh, yes, her recipe, but my mother-in-law, she created something new. We are the one and the first one who used shrimp oil. The shrimp oil yeah. and the shrimp head. Yeah. By the way, if Tom Yum became famous on its own, the Thai people had a plan for the Pad Thai. After World War II, the local prime minister suggested making a dish that would be a hallmark of Thailand. One of the noodle dishes popular at the time received a little makeover. They removed the pork and the fermented tofu, it was too Chinese. They added a few more touches here and there, and it turned out to be Pad Thai, Thailand's business card. Now let's take a look at how it's made. But hold on a second, you need to pray. Before each shift, the restaurant team offers a collective prayer for Pad Thai. This is perhaps the only place in the world where they pray for noodles. Of course, except for the Pasifarians. Also, the team jointly takes an oath to cook the best Pad Thai in Thailand and spread Thai culture to the whole world. 
Now you're ready to go. So the chef puts two types of rice noodles into the wok, adding this very secret sauce, water, and chili. I found out a few ingredients of the sauce, prawn oil, palm sugar, fish sauce, dried shrimp, shallot, and more. Add some water and chili, time to cook it. Now add tofu, Japanese radish, dry shrimp, fresh shrimp, and sprouts. A lot of sprouts. More oil and more fire. And now the final exclusive touch. The main feature of this very pad thai is this very place. They prepare the thinnest omelet right in the wok, put the ready pad thai into it, then wrap it in the omelet. Now the decoration, the dish is ready to be served. While I was filming it all, I thought I'd choke on saliva. Pad thai is just one of my favorite thai dishes, and it was very difficult for me. I'm already just in awe before trying it. I have a huge crush on pad thai. Even before this trip, I ate it quite often in Kyiv when I hit up Misha's restaurant. And what I like about this dish is that it's quite healthy. Rice noodles, lots of greens, sprouts. And that's when you're in Thailand eating like there's no tomorrow. The idea that this dish is not only tasty but also healthy calms your mind. Yeah, noodles fried in a pile of butter are very healthy, Anton. Tip Samai prepares three types of pad thai, and this is their most iconic. It's called Supabi Pad Thai. It's special because prawn oil is used here, and it's wrapped in a very thin layer of omelet. One second. Now, it feels like such an intimate moment. I'm even a little afraid to break it. Feels like I'm taking its clothes off. Listen how it sounds. As a rule, peanuts, lime, chili, and sugar are served separately with pad thai. And you can make it as spicy, sweet, or sour as you like. It feels like morkavcha. It has a similar color because of the prawn oil. No wonder they're so famous. They're so sweet and sour. Nice and chewy noodles with eggs, a nutty and prawnish flavor at the same time. It's very difficult to describe because such taste combinations aren't hardwired into the subcortex of our people, but overall, it tastes amazing. In Tip Samai, Pad Thai is served with banana flowers, but bananas have flowers? It's grass, dude. No way! Okay, dear friends, bananas are grass, as the traveler Anton Patushkin tells me. I'm eating banana flowers. Tip Samai is a luxurious example of how mission values and a systematic approach turn a small noodle stand into a nationally famous brand. My deepest respect goes out to these people and this restaurant. Dear friends, don't forget that under each episode, we publish a list of places where we were, lived, and ate. Save it and use it when traveling. We prepare very carefully for our trips, and these are usually cool places. The perfect end to an already perfect lunch would be, of course, a delicious dessert. But we're in Southeast Asia. Here's something more interesting than dessert. The best desserts in Thailand are fruit. I don't understand why there are desserts here at all, because the fruits are just mind-blowing. Here we have a rich pineapple, the most delicious mango in the world, a savory papaya, especially if you add some lime. You walk down the street, you buy a bag of bananas for 70 cents, and you don't have to worry about sweets anymore. And that's how fruit is sold on carts at every corner. I went out and bought a pineapple on a stick or a mango in a bag, and you don't need no brownies or tiramisu. The food markets of Thailand are a separate topic for discussion. There are morning, day, and nighttime ones. There is no time of day when the markets are closed. Here, they sell not only groceries like they do back home, there's a huge selection of ready-made meals. They're pretty much endless food halls, as they call them nowadays. Food markets here are located on the ground, underground, on the water, and on the rails. Still waiting for some to pop up in the air though, but I'm sure it's just a matter of time. This is the real Thailand. Bright, surreal, and delicious. We sell to the market to get some food. Here they sell Thai sprouts, fruits, greens, vegetables, palm sugar, and boat noodles. And we'll have it today for breakfast. It's basically soup. Thai people often have noodles and soup for breakfast. Weird? Okay, we'll get used to it. We went to a floating market, a typical Thai market on the water. Not your everyday market, right? What are we supposed to properly call the local food? Street food or river food? The food here is cooked and sold right on the boats, and everything else is just like on land. There are main highways, some side alleys, but they're just water instead of asphalt. Um, just... Skewered meat in Thailand is called satay. They're always small, not like those huge shaliks that we have. They can be cooked in any sauce. Usually, they slightly add some sweet sauce with a brush and... I'm holding this restaurant so it doesn't slip away from me. Pork satay in tamarind, palm sugar, coriander, and garlic sauce. 
just not Honestly, this pork tastes like chicken, and it's very, very sweet. In Asia, it's common to prepare meat in super sweet sauces. For us, it's super weird, but delicious as hell. Can I have one coconut, please? Uh, what water? The ice cream? Uh, water. What, water. Think? Water. They offer me ice cream, even though I haven't had breakfast yet. Hey, nice pomelo. How much is pomelo? Yeah, 50 baht. 50 okay. baht? A dollar fifty for a pack of pomelo? Okay. You're just sailing. Bought a pomelo from one side and a fresh coconut from the other. Cool. Look, I'm surrounded. I'll buy everything. <laughs> Amazing. For the first time in my life, I am moving around the market not on foot, but by boat. So I'm floating between the rows. I can buy bracelets, pants, satay, noodles. At the same time, the boat's still shaking. And a few times when I tried to get up, our boat commander started yelling, no, we'll tip over. So you can not only buy pants, but also tip over. In short, I can't get this picture into my head. Feels like I'm dreaming, but I'm not. I'm in Thailand. A crunchy rice pancake with cream made of whipped egg whites and sugar, and with sweet egg yolk. Holy crap! At first I thought this was a carrot, but it was egg yolk. And it reminds me of a crunchy roll with cream from our childhood. <laughs> Let's get to the main thing. Here we'll try boat noodles. This is a Thai classic that has long gone beyond the floating markets, and today you can buy it anywhere. Although the name has remained the same. So this beautiful woman's name is Auntie Tien, and she's been selling noodles on this very boat for over 40 years. That is, almost her entire life. Today she's 69, and just imagine how good she is at her craft. Directly in the boat is a saucepan consisting of three sections. In the first one, there's vegetable broth. In the second, there's water for noodles, and water for everything else in the third. Right next to her are all the ingredients she needs for work, neatly sorted on plates. At first, she puts the rice noodles, sprouts, and pork meatballs into the saucepan. They're dropped into boiling water. They don't even get cooked, but rather parboiled. And so, the noodles remain slightly firm, or as the Italians would say, al dente. And now, she adds garlic butter, fried garlic, dry shrimp, barbecue pork, fried pork sausages, coriander, fish sauce, and some sodium glutamate, which is used in Asia just like salt and pepper, minced pork, and pork and vegetable broth. MSG, aka monosodium glutamate, aka artificial flavor enhancer, is on every housewife's shelf in Asia along with salt and pepper. Our brother has some prejudice against glutamate, but in reality, it's absolutely harmless. And in Asia, they add it everywhere. All this is seasoned with white pepper and dried pig skin. The final touch is a spoonful of chili with vinegar and garlic. Now we're ready and can enjoy our meal. Ooh, it smells so good. Some nice, lean, non-greasy broth with lots of different meat and sea specialties for your taste and awesome rice noodles. It's really tasty, really healthy, and really nutritious. Nice breakfast. The floating market is a delightfully unique, incomparable phenomenon. Make sure to visit any of them here in Thailand. Believe me, in such a place, any food becomes much tastier. We got out of the boat and rushed on. Dear friends, tell me, what do you think about such a market? Let's think for a second. What's the best place for street vending? Of course, some rails, where a real train runs every two hours and you have to get up and make some space so that the train does not crush you and your goods. This market really is like a shapeshifter. Five times a day, it disappears and gets back. The locals have long gotten used to it both morally and technically. The merchants have equipped their personal rails and to fold up their spot, they need some dozens of seconds. That's how it works. Other than that, this is a normal Thai market. They sell vegetables, greens, pig faces, fish, frogs, chili, and more. And here it is. The train. Hello. Wait a second, move over. The train passed and the food trays moved back. And now it seems like a normal market, as if nothing had happened. Why the hell would anybody open a market on rails? ชื่อชื่อชื่อออค่ะก็คือว่างขายที่เนี่ยมาเอ่อคือเกิดมาก็เจอเลยก็ตอนนี้อายุ Nonchalance. That's what I really liked about this market. 
Uh, in general, no matter what that bald guy in a bucket hat told you about Thai food, no matter how much he admires it, I want to show you where we came for breakfast and what we're having. Eggs Benedict and a burrito was here. We really missed the usual European food and got here to have a European breakfast. Asians, in general, don't like European food that much. I talked to them about this. They say, we don't understand. We don't feel any taste in your food. In general, their food is so intense, so explosive in every shade and every flavor nuance, that mashed potatoes don't taste like anything to them. A burrito tastes like nothing to them as well. They don't understand, they don't feel it. For Thai people, taste is spicy, sour, sweet, sour, and sweet spicy at once. And Greek salad is like, what? Olive oil and salt? They don't feel anything. We continued our trip to the street food markets and get to the Ortor Core Market, which is highly respected by the locals. And not only is there a lot of interesting food, but also, as we were told, the best products that local entrepreneurs buy for their restaurants in the morning. Here, you can get some marvelous desserts, huge boiled seafood, tropical fruits, duck tongues, nicely fried noodles, and just ready-made foods of any color imaginable. For example, here's some freshly squeezed corn juice. It is very easy for an unprepared traveler not to understand anything in such a market. Therefore, we are helped by local TV presenter and blogger Nim, who knows a lot about food in Thailand. We're at the Orchor Kor Market, another market in Bangkok. It's open in the morning and the afternoon. When I asked Nim, our friend from Thailand, how many markets there are in Bangkok and whether you can count them, she answered, can you count the stars in the sky? No, you can't. It's the same with the markets in Bangkok. You just can't count them. At the Orchard Market, we tried Tong Eek, wax-like candy in the shape of fish and turtles. They're made from egg yolk, wheat flour, coconut milk, and sugar. Sweet, it smells like vanilla. Egg marzipan with notes of coconut milk and butter. They're quite sweet. And once again, delicious. Krong Crying, cookies with spicy caramel, coriander roots, black pepper, palm sugar, and imagine fish sauce. Everything's so unusual, so unusual. Spicy caramel. Ah, and how the aftertaste of spiciness catches up. How awesome. Spicy caramel is great, you know. These are Sai Krok sausages. I remind you that Thailand is a country of sausages. They're originally from Isan, a region in the Northeast. Isan sausages are always filled with rice. They had ginger in many places here. By the way, do you know why they serve ginger in sushi bars? Not for you to put it on your Philadelphia, but for resetting your palate between meals. While walking around the market, we found such cute multicolored pots. In Thailand, multicolored pots translate as, it's gonna get really spicy. Their spiciness can be demonstrated by the reaction of this young man. Despite me wearing glasses, my eyes are all scratchy while standing next to this place simply because the spiciness of chili is in the air. It makes my throat tickle and my eyes scratchy, even though I haven't eaten anything yet. Haven't eaten anything yet? We don't condone those words in our program, and we're dealing with it immediately. This one is a southern cuisine and okay. it's really spicy. Okay, okay, so what? Are you, are you sure? Yeah, of course, of course. Okay, yeah. so how spicy you can take? Uh, I, I have a spicy food, let's go, anything. I, I Se think. Second chance? Yeah, yeah, let, let's can? go. Okay. They think I'm afraid. Very funny. We ordered Krang Thai Pla, bamboo shoots cooked in something evil smelling with south curry paste and dry fish. Mmm, mm, very delicious. Your cheeks are red around here. They say my face is turning red. Mm. These are bamboo shoots. The bamboo tastes like salted fish. It tastes like salty stockfish or goby that you get yourself with the beer. I expected anything but the taste of salty stockfish. They explained to me where the taste of salty fish came from. This bamboo is cooked in the juice that comes from the fish liver. We ordered Kun Chang, a pork sausage with aniseed, fennel, star anise, and Sichuan pepper. And this isn't a complete recipe for its preparation, but only what I understood. What the hell is this? I've tried sausages all my life. Why do they always taste different? They're like a sweet and chewy cracker. Like what? Aftertaste? Hints of cinnamon and chocolate? Jesus, this is a sausage, right? Guys, this sausage tastes like everything but sausage. Either they all gathered here to make a fool of me like, that's a sausage, and are gonna be laughing their asses off. <laughs> what a fool. The most unexpected sausage in my life. And this is Myung Kam, some kind of dessert in some kind of leaves. No idea what those leaves are and no idea what's inside. All right, is that a chestnut? It smells weird. Some fish crap again? Onion. Dessert, right? Feels like 
onion marinated in lemon juice. All right, ginger, onion, peanut, some sourness from the green mango. Still have no idea what those leaves are. But what's that? Might be some coconut flakes and some kind of caramel. But why? Why did you add the onions? Guys, everything was so cool. The mango, peanuts, caramel, coconut, leaves, whatever. But onions? That's so weird. My brain refuses to understand how the Thai people combine ingredients and taste. Remember the cuss generator site? You enter some random words like table, lamp, watermelon, and it creates some huge cuss word. Sometimes it seems to me that Thai people have a random taste generator like pear, cow stomach juice, papaya, mango. Go! Mm. It feels like a honey nut bar and some soft and subtle dough. But of course, I don't understand how, but there's a taste of something that shouldn't be a dessert at all. Might be the radish or maybe some kind of fish sauce. I can't pronounce the name of this dessert. By the way, this isn't a dessert, but a snack. Because dessert is eaten after your meal and snacks are eaten before it, even though it's sweet. There's a steam bath with three pipes, a piece of gauze on each of them, and all this liquid is poured over it and covered with a huge hat like the Tin Man from Alice in Wonderland. And then we get this snack that I can't pronounce. That was Lion in Wonderland. And I said, Alice in Wonder? <laughs> I think that now you already know that Misha has serious problems with remembering children's cartoons. Well, they told me that I did everything wrong. Either a snack or a dessert with nuts in the thinnest dough and wrapped in salad. There's one caveat. It has radish in it. But there's something even more unexpected. Ah, oh, seriously? What a wonderful reintroduction to the snack. Turns out, I didn't add a few ingredients to this dessert. I didn't add garlic and chili, like the locals do. Salad, our beautiful blue cookie. Fucking fried garlic. Chili. Okay. What's happening? To say that I understood something about its taste would be a lie. I got even more confused. Asia and dessert is a whole nother topic. Our culinary foundations are completely different. What we might consider a dessert can hardly be a dessert for them, and vice versa. I'll tell you a story. Once I was in Vietnam and met a Chinese owner of a candy store in Saigon. He invited me to visit and rolled out lots of desserts, sat down and waited for my reaction. I tried the first one and this is some pretty bad dough with pruny beans. I think, okay, damn it, bad luck. I take the second one and it's with fermented egg yolk and they stink and I just don't know where to go and how to look cool even though I was gonna throw up. He sits right across and rejoices because he has a nice and well-known confectionery. The point being, there are very strange desserts here and the topic of a random flavor generator can be found not only on the streets and markets. The random flavor generator even penetrated transnational corporations that we all know too well. Look. Dear friends, I want to introduce you to a new sample from a unique phenomenon called the Thai Random Flavor Generator. Pork ice cream at McDonald's. This is Moo and this? Ah, uh, okay. We're not done. This is pork ice cream and it also comes with chili paste. Spicy chili paste. <laughs> She's laughing. She and her friends might be like, damn, we're really selling this crap. <laughs> Hilarious. For my observations, the pork in the ice cream is dry. It looks like a teddy bear walked right over my ice cream. This is so strange. The texture feels like eating ice cream with cotton candy. The pork is so dry that it looks like cotton candy threads. But it's still pork. Ah, the chili paste is raising hell here. A smelly fermented chili paste with pork fibers and ice cream. I can't comment on this. I just don't have any words or explanations for what's happening in this bowl. That's Thailand. Bangkok at night is also a separate planet, but from a parallel universe. Neon signs, the omnipresent aroma of cooking food, tuk-tuks rushing past you, and a very extravagant nightlife. But the main thing for us is that after sunset, night vendors with their unique dishes appear in the streets. Some of them can only be found at night when the unbelievable heat of the day subsides. There's nothing better than catching a tuk-tuk that's rushing as quick as the wind through this phantasmagoric metropolis. Here, tuk-tuk drivers are a whole subculture. First of all, they know everything about the city and will take you in Anywhere. Feel free to ask for advice. Secondly, they are pimping their ride harder than Exhibit ever could. Thirdly, traffic rules don't concern them. Damn are they fast. By the way, I have always dreamed of driving a tuk-tuk. I've never driven a tuk-tuk. Looks like it's time to try. How I stop? How I stop? This stop. This stop. Uh-huh. I'm driving a tuk-tuk. Whoa! We 
had a fun ride and came for another very important dish called somtam, or green papaya salad. For many locals, this is the most important dish in Thailand, and not tom yam or pad thai. For me, Som tam is really more popular than tom yam or any other dishes because it's very easy to eat. It doesn't need a lot of heat, you know, it's just like fresh, like making salad. And for women especially, it's a very good food to be healthy and lose weight. So you can maintain a good body with som tam. You hear that, girls? Forget about sports and proper nutrition. Papaya. That's what you need. Pam will be making Som Tam for us today. Pam moved to Bangkok from Isan, the northeast region you've heard about. And they say she cooks this dish miles better than anyone else. Which isn't surprising since Som Tam belongs to the Isan cuisine. We all know what a papaya is. It's a common fruit that's usually eaten ripe. But for a papaya salad, we need green papayas, which aren't ripe yet. And they still crunch very much like cabbage. Now let's figure out what kind of salad this is. The green papaya is cut into thin strips. Here it is. The salad is prepared in the pounder. All ingredients have to be mixed up. Chili, garlic, and MSG are placed in the pounder first. It's all getting mixed, juiced, and stirred. Now tomatoes are sliced and salted soft-shell crab is being ripped apart. This is also where the palm sugar, tamarind sauce, fresh lime, and something else are added. This liquid is called plata. The local pathos will call it the spirit of Asan or Asan cocaine. Only now papaya is put in that infernal flavor swamp. Pam is pounding it a little bit more, ready. Pam adds four different sauces in there. And when she adds this one, it smelled to me like it came out of a garbage can. These are fermented anchovies, so basically rotten fish. It's even more concentrated than in the fish sauce. I don't understand how Thais manage to turn absolutely disgusting things mixed the right way into culinary art. Sometimes is a salad with such an intense flavor. Someone likes it, someone doesn't. It's the same story as blue cheese and mold. It can be absolutely disgusting to someone, and to someone else it's outstanding. I belong to the latter. I find the flavor pleasing. When I was standing there, the individual ingredients were repulsive to me. But now that it's all put together, it's very enjoyable. It's so juicy. It's a salad where exquisite mustiness is mixed with freshness. But the freshness outweighs so much that it's amazing. This is cabbage. Someone may ask, what's it doing on the table? Cold cabbage is served with spicy food because if you drink water, it won't help you. It'll make it worse. And cabbage takes away the spiciness. It's been a long time since I've had rotten crab. You guessed it. It's disgusting. A rotten substance that feels like it was pulled out of this river and put right on my plate. By the way, it doesn't smell too bad. I vote against some Tom. What? I vote against some Tom. You vote against it. I love Thai street food so much. Just on the sidewalk, in the open air, by the canal, on plastic chairs and crumbling iron tables, these wonderful people cook their wonderful food. For Thai people, street food is not the same as for us. For us, it's still an event, a reason to go out on holidays, but it's daily life for them. Beautiful Thai daily life. And now the final and most important event of the day, J. Phi. There are only two chefs in the world who make Michelin star street food. And one of them, of course, is in Bangkok. Her name is Jay Phi, and she's the local gastronomic Mick Jagger. I once stood in line for two and a half hours for Jay Phi and got in. I once stood in the line for four hours and didn't get in. Now it looks like I'll get in, and you'll get in with me. Jay Phi is a superstar. As I said, there are hours long lines to get in. Her portraits are on groceries in local supermarkets. It's impossible to get an interview with her. That's what everyone, even the most serious ties, told us. I know the guys who made it, and they're called Netflix. Be sure to check out the series about J-Fi on Netflix. Despite all this, today at 77, just like 60 years ago, she is standing outside in the heat, wearing a ski mask so as not to burn her eyes, and cooking from morning till night on a charcoal grill the most delicious Thai food in the world all by herself. She's the only one who cooks all the meals here. Once I came some years ago to J5 and the blinds were shut on a work day and there were notes hanging everywhere, J5, get well. So it was clear that she was sick. It means that when J5 is sick, the restaurant doesn't work because only J5 is cooking there. Anyway, let's go. What do chefs and restaurant owners do when they get a Michelin star? They shove it in everyone's face and hang star posters in restaurants. And rightfully so, they deserve it. But J5 has no mention of her star anywhere. I'm at J5. I'm at J5. 
The dishes are served on a first-come, first-served basis. You can wait a very long time because the food is prepared by only one person, j herself. We were waiting for our three dishes for over an hour. No one was nervous, everyone was waiting. That's the crab omelet. You can't imagine how famous this dish is here. Generally, crab omelet is prepared in every corner of Thailand, but that crab omelet and this one, they're like from different worlds. And that's what I'm going to eat now. What can you say about it? It's a little scary. Well, first of all, it's officially the most delicious omelet I've ever had in my life, without any comparison. Secondly, it's called a crab omelet, but let's be honest, it's a crab with an omelet. How she does this is the kind of crust on the omelet I don't understand. I don't understand how it turns out so perfectly smooth. I don't understand how it turns out that crunchy. I don't get it. The coolest thing about J5 is that she basically does everything herself. She's the head chef, and no one cooks except her. It seemed like you could find a team 10,000 times over and just manage the processes, but it's not the case. That's why it is so cool, because a person has been doing the same routine for 60 years and has achieved straightforward success in it. Respect, I told you, do it yourself. We also tried this dish called dry tom yam, and this one, her famous drunken noodles. Of course, all of this is absolutely genius and marry me Andrew. But then, something even more special happened, and j Fi agreed to take a break and give us a few minutes to talk. ขนาดซอสเครื่องไก่ต้นเช็คไปยังเลยค่ะคือบอกแล้วเค้าจะแปลงอ่ะบางทีพอเรารู้ว่าเค้าหลุดเราอารมณ์เสียเลยอ่
In fact, Misha, after talking to Jay Fai, I've rarely seen him like that. In fact, I feel like it's the same for him as it would be for me to talk to Casey Neistat. I mean, she's basically one of his idols, and the fact that we talked to her today is very cool. For me, the story of Jay Fai is not so much a story about food as it is about a human's dedication to their craft. Imagine, Jay Fai has honed her cooking skills every day for 60 years, and she still enjoys the work. I have nothing but wild admiration for that. I want to be like Jay Fai. Yes, Jay Fai is a genius chef, and the whole world has already recognized that. What is particularly impressive is not the insanely delicious food here, but her unconditional love for her craft and endless perseverance from the very beginning till the very end. Dear friends, if you love food, you should definitely come to Bangkok at least once in your life and try what goes on here. Because Jay Fai cooks her own food, there are no more chefs here who touch the food, so this opportunity won't last forever. Today, Jay Fai is 77. And as it happens in life, when that moment comes and J-Fi passes away, so does this place. So get your ass to Bangkok to try the amazing food of J-Fi. Well, in any other country in the world, after a day like this, we could have gone home to rest, full of experiences and food. But we're in Bangkok. Things are just starting now. It's 10 o'clock and night food markets all over the city have already opened. And that's a Thai gastronomic phenomenon. And we'll tell you about it in the next series. You shouldn't eat after 7 p.m.? Don't make the Thais laugh. In the next episode, we'll be going to the night food markets and trying one of the oldest animals on the planet. It's 400 million years old, has blue blood, and its closest relatives are spiders. We'll meet a chef who decided to create art that can be eaten. He even generously painted my portrait on a pancake. We'll eat a half corn dog, half mozzarella hot dog. We'll try four kinds of larva and walk around places where it's unclear whether you're in a Ridley Scott or Gaspar Noe movie right now. See you at the night markets.